Good evening, and welcome to Indiana University Cinema's virtual screening room for Secrets of the Surface, the Mathematical Vision of Miriam Mirzahi. This introduction and the following Q&A will all feature live captioning. To turn on captions, move your mouse to the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, click on Live Transcript, then click Show Subtitle. If you have any issues, feel free to ask a question using the Q&A box, which you can reach by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. To begin tonight's program, IU Cinema wishes to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University is built upon indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miamiaki, the Lenape, the Boruadmik, and the Sawanwa peoples as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. We ask you to reflect on the lives and histories of the indigenous communities from wherever you are watching tonight. My name is Jessica Davis Tagg. I'm the Events and Operations Director at IU Cinema. On behalf of the entire IU Cinema team, we'd like to thank you for being here for tonight's screening of Secrets of the Surface, the Mathematical Vision of Mariam Mirzahani, which will then be followed by an interactive Q&A with our panel. To introduce the film tonight, we are joined by Kevin Pilgrim. Dr. Pilgrim is professor and chair of mathematics at IU Bloomington. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley under the direction of Curtis McMullen. Although this makes him the mathematical brother of Miriam Mirzakhani, he tells us that unfortunately they have never met. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks very much, Jessica. Welcome. Across the world, throughout the millennia, math was used to solve practical problems. But there's also evidence that math was viewed as something that touched people more deeply. An Egyptian document more than 3,600 years old, the rhymed mathematical papyrus, contains a puzzle of sevens that's very close to the nursery rhyme riddle. As I was going to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives, and every wife had seven sacks. So from the very beginning, people understood that math is not only practical, but playful, and is something that kindles our imagination. And as people sought to understand the order in the universe, to develop their calendars, they looked to the stars and they saw not only rhythm, pattern and order, but mysteries like eclipses and comets. And they were curious. And as their knowledge grew, so too did their ignorance and the mysteries deepened. And the discoveries challenged cherished assumptions like the very notions of time, of distance and of the shape of space. And the theoretical became also practical. Our GPS systems use the theory of relativity and our banks use number theory to keep transactions secure. So from the very beginning, curiosity about math and science has been part of what makes us human. The two films last week's Sepeda Reaching for the Stars and tonight's Secrets of the Surface feature scientists from Iran. Their stories remind us of the universal appeal of math and science, and they highlight the challenges of viewing science and math not as mere practical tools or austere experiments removed from everyday people's lives, but as expressions of human flourishing itself. Tonight's event is part of the IU Cinema's creative collaboration series. It is sponsored by the College of Arts and Sciences Department of Mathematics, the Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies Department of Central Eurasian Studies and the Center for Excellence in Women in Technology here at Indiana University. I'd like to thank the IU Cinema Creative Collaborations Board, Associate Director Brittany Friesner, IU Cinema staff, and Dr. Shayar Danishkar of the Department of Central Eurasian Studies for his thoughtful and persistent efforts to bring this event to fruition and for serving as host for the panel discussion following tonight's film. I hope you'll all stay. Our, our panelists include people who knew Mariam Mirzakhani personally, who know about her mathematics, and who know about how her achievements were described in Iran. Thank you all for being here. Jessica will now explain how to view the film. Thank you, Kevin, for that introduction. Everyone, please come back if you can for the conversation and Q&A after the film. 
After the introduction, you'll see a link to the film on your screen. Please note the film program will not screen through this Zoom webinar. You will need to open a web browser to watch the film using the website and the case sensitive password provided. We will see you after the film. And again, thank you for joining us. Welcome back to IU Cinema's virtual screening room and our Q&A about the movie Secrets of the Surface, The Mathematical Vision of Maryam Mirzakhani. I'd like to remind you that this Q&A will feature live captioning. To turn on captions, move your mouse to the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, click on live transcript, then click show subtitle. We will start the Q&A with a conversation between our guests and about 20 minutes in, we will start answering audience questions. Please feel free to begin typing questions into the Q&A box at any time, which you can reach by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. The moderator for tonight's panel is Dr. Shayar Danishgar. He is a faculty member in the Department of Central Eurasian Studies in the Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies, where he teaches Persian and Turkic languages. Please welcome Shayar Danishgar. Welcome everyone. We would like to welcome you to our panel discussion. We hope that you will find the panel discussion informative and interesting. Tonight, we are gathered here to honor and celebrate the life and achievements of Maryam Mirzakhani, the first ever female recipient of Fields Medal in Mathematics, also referred to as Nobel Prize in Mathematics. On July 14th, 2017, the worlds of science and humanity lost Maryam Mirzakhani to the battle of cancer when she was only 40 years old. Both the science and humanity, because of individuals like Maryam, have become a better place to live and hope for a brighter future for humanity, especially for the women in the society as well as in the sciences. We have four panelists today here on this panel. Uh, each person will have a chance to uh, respond to a few questions. And uh, again, as Jessica said, we, are encu we encourage our audience to uh, do the same thing. If you have any questions, you can easily uh, respond to us. Let me change the background of my talk. Wonderful. Our panelists are Dr. Laura DeMarco, Professor of Mathematics at Harvard University, Dr. Shabnam Kovusian, Professor of Informatics in the School of Informatics at Indian University, Dr. Julia Palvnik, the uh, Charlotte and Griffin Professor of Mathematics in the Department of Mathematics at Indian University, Dr. Hossein Banai, Professor of Political Science in Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies. I will start my question with uh, Professor DiMarco. You had the fortune of knowing Mariam at Harvard University and worked with her uh, with the same mentors. On the human side of Mariam, what could you tell us about your first and many other encounters with Maryam. Was there an aha moment? Did you notice anything unusual in Maryam, which could have hinted that you were working with a bright future scientist? What okay. could you tell our audiences about the human quality of Maryam? What kind of a person she was? What was your experience working with her? Those are my first questions for you, please. Yeah. Sure, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so so I met Mariam roughly 20 years ago, maybe a bit more than 20 now. So we were graduate students together at Harvard. And as, as you just heard, we were working with the same professor, the same advisor, Kurt McMullen, who appears in the film and was telling us about Mariam's work and his thesis, her thesis and what she had done after. Um, so, of course, we knew each other very well. I mean, we were a very small group of students that were working 
on closely related projects. So we spent a lot of time together. Um, in fact, one of the other students in our group was also featured uh, in the film, Izet Joshkun shows up. Uh, he was in Chicago standing by the window of his apartment. And he was the one talking about the dinners that we would have together when she was cooking and dancing. And so we, yes, we spent a lot of time together, but I have to say truthfully that I can't say that I knew her so well. And, and maybe it came through in the film. She was very private. So she did not talk a lot about her personal life. She, she um, I think Izette mentioned in the film also that she didn't talk about politics. She didn't share her views. And there was a lot going on at the time. And this was 2000, 2001, 2002. So with September 11th, there was a lot going on in this country and um, she, did not, she did not share her, her thoughts on those things. So there were a lot of things I didn't know. Also in the film, I noticed a lot of people mentioning how, how they were surprised. All of a sudden she was involved with Jan von Drack, so we didn't even know. So that was a big surprise. She was very, very private. Um, but I will say she did talk a lot about mathematics. We talked of course, in great detail about our work. And, and she was special. I mean, she was, um, I mean, no, one couldn't say, oh, this student is going to be the one that wins the Fields Medal. We couldn't know that at the time. But I think what was most impressive to me was how, how, how probing she was, how, how she was really able to ask the right questions and, and see connections and worked so hard to, to, to figure something out that was really difficult and a, and a struggle and where a lot of us might have given up. Um, I mean, her, her work was really very impressive. Thank you very much. I have follow-up questions that uh, I hope that uh, our colleague also, uh, Julia Pavnik will also uh, join you answering this question is mostly related to scientific or mathematics that many of us might not have a clear idea exactly uh, how uh, the theory or things that uh, she was working on it. So mathematically speaking, uh, what was one of the most significant contribu contributions of Mariam? Was it the development of a theory or body of the techniques or the solving of some particular problem. Moreover, what do you think is the lasting impact? And the second question, if I may uh, continue, is that when thinking about how to support and to encourage women in science, based on your own experiences, what do you think is the most important issue for academic leadership to know? So this question is for both of you. I have another question for uh, Julia, but uh, if you wanna answer that, you can do it now, but I could also continue with the question for uh, Julia. Should I do that? Maybe then you could think about it, uh, Laura. Oh, I, I'm happy to say just a, a couple words. I, I, um, I just I wasn't sure if, if Julia was gonna jump in. Um, no, I'm from her, in terms of her mathematics, I mean, my, the real lasting impact, I mean, her theorems were spectacular and very useful and are being used all the time. And this is talked about in the film. But what's most striking is uh, the questions that she asked that she put out there for other people, for all of us to work on. And this has been enormous. I mean, these ideas that she's that she put out there that were really surprising connections that we did not expect. And this from my point of view, was really why she's so well recognized and deserves to be so well recognized. I mean, based on some of these ideas that she had and the connections that she made that were that were really unexpected and powerful in mathematics. Um, Julia, do you want to say something? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Yeah, I, I have to say that my expertise in math it's uh, kind of further from Mariam's work, but I do agree with Laura what she brings here, like something very excited, I think as a mathematician is seeing connections between so many different topics, areas in mathematics. So how can you use 
uh, the point of view of one to solve problems in the other, how they connect. And I think that that is spectacular. And I, and from what I have seen, seems like she integrates very well different uh, fields, different areas, and in a very special and original way. So I think that's a great uh, thing. And also, I think that she being the first woman in achieve this uh, field medal, which, as you said, is like the Nobel Prize for math. It has also a lasting, a lasting impact uh, because I think that that gives that gave and gives like uh, girls and women like uh, a different perspective now or more hope on on what we can achieve as mathematicians. I'm not meaning that we want to achieve the field medal, but I don't know that that there is space for us that we belong also in this in this field you know it's a very male dominated field and i that, think it was also important uh, that yeah that's exactly what my next question was about you talked about the uh, she being a role model how important it is but i wanted to ask you you julia as a, a woman scientist have you noticed a significant change or breakthrough in the field of mathematics in terms of being more accepted as a female or woman scientist in a field which has been dominated by males throughout the history have you noticed some changes as you were or are doing your research how can fields like mathematics become more inclusive what are the main challenges for the young female scientists today i think uh, i don't know if i can say that i see big changes but i think that there has been some changes and i think that's already some pro it's like progress like i think the vision is changing a little and I think one of the most important things that at least the topic is now discussed, like we know that that there is something important to be done on this regard, because if you see at least here in most of universities, the percentage of women, it's maybe 10% of faculty female or maybe 20, uh, if you're lucky. And so I think now this topic is on the table and people are thinking about it. So I think that's a, a shift that it's happening. Um, I do think that it's a lot of things to do still. Um, I think some people think that it's important and some others just uh, maybe not yet. Maybe they don't realize yet that diversity in general, in particular with this topic of gender, but in general is important that that gives a, a better a way to do math and any other thing, having di diverse voices uh, being here. I think it's important in any, in, a, in any area. Uh, and I think one of the problems, maybe it's that, that we lack of role models sometimes. Like, as I, I was saying, there are not that many women. So sometimes you go to a conference and maybe you see one female speaker or, and so you start doubting, can I do it? Why there are no, no more people like me doing this? Or even in some sometimes kind of, uh, I don't know if saying bureaucratic or, <laughs> aspects but some of the things are not even considered we cannot spend i don't know grant money in in child care for example but you are supposed to do all the same things while you have a kid right uh, so i think that that there are a lot of things that need to be revised uh, but i do think that people is thinking more about it it's talking more about it and i think that's nice i think having mentors it's good <laughs> talking to people asking questions uh, and I think having networks is also good professional networks, but also support networks. Uh, I'm also from another country. So when I arrived, I, I was lucky and I find a lot of people to ask questions to from things like how do you rent an apartment? How do you, I don't know, get your SSN to things more important or not more important, but things like how is the teaching style here? Uh, or, or other kind of things, or what I was supposed to do as an academic here, I don't know, and, and that was helpful. And also, of course, some support network in the personal life is also useful. Uh, I don't know, That's Laura, if you want to give your vision also. Yeah, from what you're telling us that we still have a long way to go, but it is good to have this conversation out there because I am sure that the deans and professors, uh, uh, deans and presidents of universities, they are listening to us because this is a very strong message that we are giving to them, that we need to share the field of sciences uh, with other colleagues, particularly female mm -hmm. colleagues. 
I think this might also help us to uh, maybe ask uh, our good colleague, Shabnam Kavusian, and uh, I have questions in this regard to her. Let me say that uh, uh, Professor Shabnam Kavusian, uh, my general question is that you were a fellow student when Maryam was attending the Sharif Technical University of Tehran, am I right? That's my understanding. Yeah. Yes, and you also work with same mentors at the university, if I'm not mistaken. You work with the yes. same people as Laura did uh, at Harvard. Do you have any anecdote or story about Maryam to share with us? Yes. Was there a buzz among students about a woman student, namely Maryam, who was regarded as unusually bright? I am sure that you were one of them too. Everybody thinks that, you know, their colleagues are bright. Doesn't mean that you guys were not, but you know, certain individuals, they have important, I mean, they're like magnet, you know, people say, oh my goodness. I mean, we could speak about Mozart and great geniuses, you know, they were unusual. They were great artists, but they were just <laughs> super artists. So was there an anecdote that you would like to sh share with our audience, please? Yes, uh, for sure. Um, I was about three, four years older than Mariam. So when she came to university, um, I was graduating, um, but I completely remember her very clearly. We shared similar mentors. Uh, all of them were interviewed in this movie, actually, interestingly, Dr. Mahmoudian, Dr. Tabesh, and Dr. Shah Shahani. They were amazing role models for all of us. Uh, in an interesting way, they kind of put a shield around all of us to protect us from all the upheavals that there were for women. Um, there are many, many stories about them and how they helped us achieve the highest levels we could achieve. And similarly with Mariam. So I remember precisely Dr. Mahmoudian telling us about this brilliant girl who fought so hard to get to go to the International Olympiad because until Mariam went, Mariam and Roya, nobody had gone, no woman had gone to International Olympiad, not because they couldn't, because the government wouldn't allow, women to go. So somehow they got, uh, when they were in, in high school, and they were in this special high school for gifted and talented students, female students, um, they, with the help of their principal, they fought and they, they achieved <laughs> this, this win that was huge for all of us. We celebrated that a lot amongst women in mathematics. Um, we were older, so it was past us, but we were happy for the future females who could have hope to go to the international and participate in international Olympiad. Um, up until then, uh, we could have written the test and go up to the country level for that, but we couldn't leave the country for the international contest. So mm -hmm. Mariam and Roya went, they were successful. They um, behaved according to the laws of the Iranian government, which are very strict. So they opened the door for the rest of female students uh, to be able to go and travel wow. and so that was a huge achievement and I remember a lot of buzz around that um, and another a very important thing was of course everybody knew um, right away that she is totally um, um, above and beyond right in mm -hmm. terms of the ability and um, and her scores in math olympiad also were very impressive um, Again, as, a, as the first female who was sent to the Olympiad, the fact that she achieved almost perfect score the first year and exactly perfect score the second year was huge as well. So I remember we always had this buzz about all the people who went to Olympiad during our year as going up because they would all come to our department uh, in Sharif. Um, but the year Mariam came, it was like much more uh, pronounced because of that. I see. So you, in your uh, sharing the anecdote with us, you did mention that she really had, uh, Roya and uh, she, they had really hard time going out of the country, participating in the Olympiad. Uh, my next questions are related really. Could you tell us about the challenges, other challenges and difficulties that uh, women students and ind individuals like you and Mariam experienced while growing up in Iran and going to school? Do you know or think if the situations have changed or still exist? I know that the professors in Iran, they considered students like you their, to be their own students, their own children. They wanted to have the best for them. Professors had no problem with that. 
This was an issue with the government, the system, which did not provide the, the, the right tools for the woman to reach their potentials. The, the professors everywhere in the world, they, are, they give their lives for their students. And you teach at Indiana University, a big university, and work with female students daily. Do the American women students feel the same challenges as the female students in Iran? If not, how are their issues different from the, the ones that you or Mariam experience? Could you speak to that, please? Sure. I think these are two questions. One was the challenges of female students in Iran. This is a very interesting, um, I found that extremely interesting. That might have been the biggest culture shock scientifically for me when I moved to North America, um, that women were seen as less capable in sciences and mathematics in general. This did not exist in Iran. In Iran, even though women were by law kind of looked at second hand as, as secondhand citizens, ma mathematically and scientifically, we were not. We were always supported um, as, as there was, it was a good mention of that in the movie that by Roya and the professors as well, about half the students in math department were female. Um, we never felt like a minority uh, as far as like you talk about females being in a minority in, in technical fields. That was not the case in Iran. Um, um, we were very much supported by, yes, by our professors, by even in high school. Uh, I think you saw the principal of Mariam's high school speaking, but in the same for me in my high school, the, um, we were very much supported as, as women and encouraged to go and study in technical fields, mathematics, sciences. Um, and that was the biggest, biggest change when, when I moved to the universities in North America, realizing that women see themselves either by the society or by families um, as, as, as mathematics not being kind of a suitable field for them. Um, that was a huge culture shock for me. I did not expect that. And the fact that people would ask me, oh, as a woman, could you go to university in Iran? I'm like, yeah, what do you mean? Of course I could. Um, so that, uh, the fact, like people's view of Iran um, in that sense is, 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 is not quite right. Uh, in some cases, people think that we cannot go to university or cannot study these fields, which is not accurate, but also, um, there is a huge difference here that students face different challenges here. I think female students in technical fields uh, field, um, have different challenges. Uh, another thing that I don't know, I, I have thought about it, but I don't have any data about it. It's just anecdotal. In Iran, um, all of our high schools are segregated in terms of gender. So um, we have schools for women and schools for men and uh, that's it and so when you are in high school growing up and trying to figure out what you want to study you are only within a female group um, and so th that that environment itself might be something that contributes to not viewing yourself as less than or um, being dominated mm. because I have visited a lot of high school classrooms here um, in my role when I was in math department and I see a lot of classrooms are male dominated by students. The students who ask questions are male. The mm. teachers pay more attention to male students. And so, so that kind of itself uh, also, I think is, is a problem that students here face um, that needs to be addressed in my view. But as far as challenges in Iran goes, of course, I think the political side of it is very well known and uh, well documented in the United States, so I, I, I'm not going to go into the details of that. But but as far as personal experiences go, we really did not uh, personally did not face um, challenges per se for that, except whatever the government was imposing on us, like traveling for in International Olympia. That was a government um, problem, and thankfully it got solved. And you ask if things are better now, I really have no idea. I haven't been back to Iran for more than 12 years. Mm -hmm. So I have no idea, unfortunately, what's going on there right now. I don't know if it's better okay. um, or worse. Um, what I'm hearing is it's not better. Okay. <laughs> well, 
I think uh, you mentioned the politics. Now we're going to go to a political scientist here. We have somebody here. I hope that he would be able to <laughs> respond to some of the questions. Uh, I have my good friend, colleague, Professor Hussein Banai. Uh, Professor Banai, I wonder if you, as a political scientist, could speak to the social impacts and the ramification of Maryam's success story for the country and the political system in which she grew up and in and its significance worldwide. Uh, as we know, Maryam was a symbol of pride in her country and yet a dilemma for the regime in terms of how to handle Maryam's success. On one hand, the officials wanted to appropriate her name as their own while enforcing the status quo. Before Maryam passed away, and even when she received the Fields Medal Award, there was a cold, warm reception within the government. Uh, I might be wrong. I hope that you could address this issue. The irony is that when bright individuals like Maryam are in the country, those in power do not care or acknowledge them. However, when they are recognized outside of the country, suddenly the officials decide to take advantage of situation saying, yes, Maryam is an Iranian. She, uh, the world should know about that. She's one of us. How was the news of Maryam's passing away received in Iran? The newspapers, as far as I know, had her pictures all over with scarves without the scarf. What was this such a controversial issue in Iran? Finally, what does Maryam mean to many young women, not only in Iran, but around the world? Well, um, <laughs> there's a lot of very complicated questions, but thank you for fielding them. Let me just say uh, how wonderful it is to be on this panel with um, my distinguished colleagues here, all of whom are far more knowledgeable and accomplished in the field of mathematics and could speak as they have so eloquently about um, Maryam's trajectory accomplishments, and but also the meaning for the field of mathematics, which ultimately I think is what her legacy is. As the film shows, I think she is a world historical figure in, in, in that particular field. She has been um, a pioneer uh, as the first female winner of the Fields Medal. Um, and as she herself um, would have wanted, um, I think uh, her work, uh, her pursuit of knowledge in the field of mathematics um, should have really trumped politics. Let me just say that from the um, get go. I feel like an intruder here trying to talk about politics about something that is far more beautiful and universal and encompassing um, and than what I have to say about the political context that as Shabnam so eloquently said, um, is uh, very well known in terms of the atmosphere, the stifling atmosphere that it creates for um, talented individuals in, across many different fields, not just mathematics. Um, uh, the phenomena you just mentioned about the regime wishing to appropriate her success, her being memorialized posthumously more than she was when she was alive, um, that's not unique to her, sadly. You see this in Iranian film, uh, accomplishments of Iranian cinema uh, on the world stage, for instance, you see it um, in uh, in the world of literature. You see it in music. Um, you see it in fields that are far more um, directly connected to politics in terms of their impact than mathematics is. Um, that's a story of authoritarian politics in many countries. You see it from Stalinist Russia to today, uh, with you know various composers and brilliant engineers and. Uh, mathematics and chemists and um, individuals of high talent. Um, so story, Mariam's story uh, with respect to the regime in Iran um, is not unique. You see there are many different examples of it li like that in the case of such outstanding, brilliant outliers um, uh, in, 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 in different fields. But perhaps what um, is unique in the case of the Islamic Republic um, that was touched on a little bit in the uh, film, but for those of us who've lived in Iran and especially grown up in post-revolutionary Iran, it's much more recognizable. Um, and that is the kind of, um, the, the, the sheer persistence, uh, the, the kind of unabashed pursuit of knowledge that can rise above the kind of petty politics that any regime could provide in, 
the way of um, determined people. Um, and that persistence is not just the individual, but the community. I was so glad to see the community of mentors and classmates um, and uh, uh, colleagues of Mariam's be so prominently um, uh, interviewed in the film. Um, and that's something that directly spoke to my experience of many other people that I know their experience of these kind of private zones of freedom that are created. Um, that talent, uh, that thirst for knowledge nevertheless um, organically develops out of and oh how wonderful it is to see it in the case of Mariam for it to actually come to fruition in such a incredibly important uh, in world historical terms. Um, uh, way. Um, so it's uh, to kind of more directly answer your question here, I think that petty politics of the regime is really unremarkable. It's something they've done across many different fields. And um, what's what's unique in this story here is actually Mariam just her pursuit of her passion and interest um, surpassing all that. And then by doing that, giving us a beautiful example of what freedom actually means the freedom that comes with that untrammeled, unabashed pursuit of knowledge um, that she carried all the way across the world. And, um, uh, uh, and sadly, were it not for her untimely death, um, uh, even her own uh, 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 government of her own home country was finally forced to admit it, you know, Photoshopped headscarves with notwithstanding. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you and IU Cinema and our sponsors. Uh, this has been a, a wonderful gathering of scholars and people who are in the field and people who come from the country, know the country firsthand. I would like to turn over now the uh, podium to uh, Jessica Davis Tag uh, to welcome the questions. I see many questions are posed already, so we will open up the floor to the questions, please. Yes, uh, we've been receiving some great questions. There's still time for you also to submit a question. You can do so by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and then typing your question in the Q&A box. Um, our first question is from Shikha who asks, so we've been talking about some of the obstacles that Mariam had faced. What are some of the factors that helped Mariam overcome those typical obstacles that women and other underrepresented scholars face in male-dominated fields? I might respond to that. I think we saw that vividly in the, uh, in the movie and the comments that we had from our uh, colleagues, uh, Hossein and Shabnam. I think the story of the success was the support that they got uh, from their female and mentors. They were very crucial. And I think we should make also a distinction that in Iran, depending which, uh, which sector of the society, which part of the society you come from, families really uh, support their children, whether you are boy or girl, to excel in your studies. And that goes without saying, we have to be honest about that. But I think the teachers, they are the number one who, uh, sort of light this uh, candle in your heart that you know that you can do it, you can do it. Uh, uh, maybe Shabnam and Hossein could s speak to that or our colleagues, Laura and Julia. I'll just, I'll just chime in about the, the, the years of graduate school. Of, of course, I don't know about the support she received except from the film prior to that. But while we were in graduate school, we certainly had a lot of support, and especially from our advisor, who Kurt McMullen, who was absolutely fantastic, fantastic, and very supportive. And the advisor plays the role of, of course, helping the students while they're students, but also afterwards. And um, and that is also making a difference, as well as peers. And we were, and there was a group of us, and um, and her friend Roya, who was in the film all the time was there. And so, yeah, so the network, the network was tremendous. I'd say. Julia, how about your country in, in Argentina? Do you have the same issues, challenges? What would you say are the really major help to uh, women students to excel in their field? 
I feel like it's a little bit different than here. So in some sense, I don't think we have maybe as much support as we saw in Iran. But I do think, for example, that I didn't thought, I didn't think that like being a woman in math was something strange when I was in Argentina. I did see more women in math in Argentina. Later, I did realize that maybe the mm, the ones that were full professors were, were less, but still I, I could see a lot of women in there. So I think that there is maybe something here uh, and maybe what Jaffman was saying, maybe in the in high school or something where you are less encouraged or where the male students are more dominant and you feel like maybe you don't uh, have a say and maybe you should study something else. Like maybe the STEM are not that that much suited for women. Uh, but in Argentina, I felt like we like we had a good number of mm, women professors and I didn't feel like an outsider. Uh, Great. Uh, the next question is actually from uh, Tishabnam from Michelle. Uh, to what extent do you think Maria, Mariam's experience attending an all-female school may have contributed or helped to foster her success? Um, yes, as I, as I mentioned, this is something that's been in my mind for a very long time, um, especially visiting schools in the United States. In, in Indiana, I haven't visited other schools, but in Indiana, when I go and visit high schools, it's kind of a very different environment um, from schools that we attended in Iran. Um, like there is a huge emphasis on sports, I think. And with that comes some emphasis on specific type of um, um, popularism in, in sense of uh, being in, involved in sports, where in Iran, um, it's students that are popular are often students who are like very good at math or sciences. And that was a very big, uh, for me, like knowing that the word geek or uh, nerd is a bad, has a bad connotation was very eye-opening. I called my best friend a nerd and he was very upset with me. And I'm like, is that a bad word? And he was like, yes. And I said, I'm so sorry. I didn't know that. Um, so I thought it's a positive word. And so there are many cultural differences, I think, in a sense, I don't know how much of it has to do with all female school, um, because um, part of me was very angry that our schools were separated. <laughs> so I, I don't want to advocate for that at all, uh, but I don't know how much of it is really related to that and how much of it is a cultural phenomenon. Hussein? Yeah, if I may say something about um just in terms of upbringing in Iran and Iranian schools from early on, uh, math and sciences are really the higher subjects. Um, and the amount of value that's placed on them by families, let alone school principals and administrators, it's really uh, very different than uh, many Western or democratic countries. So excelling in those subjects, especially from an early age, really does set you apart not just in your school, but amongst your uh, uh, family friends and uh, families, and, th and that itself becomes a motivating factor. Great. Uh, the next question is for the mathematicians. Uh, Ava asks, in the film, they made references to Mirza Khani's way of visualizing her work I, as though like with her big drawing pads. And it seemed like they were commenting that that was unusual. Was that a quirk specific to her and her imaginative spirit? Or has it become a more common way of working through and interpreting mathematical concepts and problems? That's a wonderful question. Um, we all think very differently. And um, she was especially visual, I would say. Um, a lot of us spend time drawing. I have my scratch work here. I was just looking over at my, my notes from today. You know, it, it's all pictures, but it's also numbers and computations too. And people in different fields tend to write different things or draw different things. It depends on how you're working. It's very personal. Um, so yes, she was especially visual. I wouldn't say that was unique to her. There are lots of people who think visually, but 
but it was, I think, more than more than others, more than my other friends and colleagues. I don't know, Holia, your your area, you probably draw a lot too. <laughs> Julia, anything you want to say about that one? Oh yeah, I, when when you said about this question, yeah, I thought the same. Like we do, we have, for example, diagrams or things like we see and. I agree with Laura that each of us has a different way to think and a different intuition. You know, when I was studying geometry, I couldn't even imagine the torus, that it's this surface that they speak and the like the geodesics or the things. And I was like, no, I don't see it. And some friends of mine explained me how to visualize. I don't have that kind of visual visualization, but I think each of us has a different kind of vision. Like I do have intuition in a very different way, like algebraic way, and we do different kind of drawings and equations and things uh, and from what i have seen in in her work and all this i i have the feeling that i, I mean i haven't met her or discussed with her uh, but i do have the feeling that she was very visual and also like the thing that the advisor bring in the movie also i think like she had all these ideas in her mind like all these uh, visions but not only like the figure it was more like this universe that you wanted to create or something so I, I feel like it's in that direction that they were saying but I don't know I, I never met her or I'm not that familiar with the work like so. great um Allison asks has Miriam's success affected education in Iran or affected Iranian women who are working in STEM Hussein, that might be a question for you. Do you know? Um, unfortunately, I'm ignorant about this in terms of the direct impact. I mean, in the film, you see younger female mathematicians talking about the positive impact that she's made, the naming of buildings and halls of mathematic, uh, mathematics and um, greater awareness of her achievement undoubtedly um, has trickle down um, impact. Um, at a motivational level, at a programmatic level, whether there is more resources invested in um, schools or uh, um, whether there's something more systematic in play, I'm, I, I'm not aware of. Um, and uh, I think if there were, they would probably be included in the film, um, uh, given that the range of people that are still active in Iran were interviewed in the film, so I would imagine not. I don't know if Shabnam has more to add to this. Uh, yes, I agree with you. I think I think that is the extent of like naming things after her, um, but I'm not quite sure if there is any specific resources. Uh, we saw a movie last week, the Sepide. Uh, in that movie, they were also showing some of the challenges that that young lady had. She wanted to become an astronaut. How many challenges she had? There were numerous challenges. So we could see that there. As Shabnam and Hossein said, yes, uh, I was reading that they have named so many high schools after her name and programs, institutes. So, well, she has become a role model and people will learn about it. Okay, there was a, a female who had this, uh, uh, intention to become a great scientist and that definitely plays a role in the minds of young people that I can do the same thing so it's a positive role model but to what extent the certain regimes and governments are providing that uh, that uh, platform for them to achieve what they want that's a question that uh, needs to be uh, further studied and done in, in the sciences. Fantastic. Um, I think we got time for about two more questions. So the next one is Burhan asks, it seems that math education in Iran is highly valued and very competitive. Could somebody uh, say a few things on math education in Iran? I, <laughs> may I jump in? Of Hussein, course. Hussein talked about it, but I could tell you from my own experience here. Uh, Teaching here at the university, I often come across with uh, young Iranian students, male or female, who came from Iran, and they go to high school here. And when they come to IU, in any fields of sciences, biology, chemistry, they think this is a joke. Really, they say first year math in US is joke because we already covered this when we were in 
in 10th grade and 9th grade. I mean, biology, they know all these things. It's just a breeze for them. So as Hossein said, really, it is very valued and students have very solid knowledge in sciences. When they come here, I mean, that's a breeze for them. So that's my experience from talking to them. When you ask them, say, no, that's, is it hard? No, this is nothing. You know, we have already covered this. <laughs> so that's good news. I hope that we could see that here in this country because some of our students really, they are not up for that challenge, unfortunately. I think Shabnam is probably has the most direct experience with this, having actually studied mathematics in Iran. <laughs> yes, um, yes, it is quite, it is quite different. The mathematics education in Iran, there is a divide um, for sure. So in high school, we divide students. The students get divided somehow, either based on their interests or their grades, into math and sciences. Um, natural sciences, which is like more uh, people who want to become doctors, like medical doctors, and then arts and also social studies and humanities. So there are four brand, main branches where the high schools actually separate, high school students separate at that, at that first grade of high school. And so the students who go to this uh, physic, physics and mathematics, basically, at a hierarchy are like, uh, they count as a highest hierarchy kind of. So they are kind of allowed to go to any field they want to study. And, um, and it gives you a bit of freedom in that sense. To, so it encourages you to study math and science in that some way. Um, and also, so then when you, so you study uh, hours and hours of mathematics and physics and chemistry when you are in high school. Um, and uh, so it's quite concentrated. So that, I think that makes a big difference as far as math education is concerned. All right, uh, the final question is from Allison to, to say, uh, do you have any advice for women starting out in math or STEM fields? And I'd actually like to broaden that out and ask each of you individually what you might want to say uh, to any young women out there who are embarking upon a career in STEM. Uh, let's start with Shabnam, maybe? Sure. Um, I work with a lot of students um, myself, and I always say, because in, as I say, in the United States, we have to kind of undo some of the cultural um, effects of how sciences and mathematics are not really viewed um, somehow. It's, it's different, but Anyway, I always say, don't imagine a stereotypical programmer, for example, when I'm teaching programming. Don't try to like look at the media or the TV shows or movies to figure out what the stereotypical programmer looks like. Uh, see yourself. There is no specific way that you have to think to become a good programmer. Every type of thinking can be trained to become a good programmer. And the same in mathematics, I believe there are for sure some people who are talented, that, that talent exists, that giftedness exists, um, but also there is a lot of training and hard work that goes into it. For most of us who studied mathematics, we enjoy being challenged. It's not that it comes easy. It's just when you sit and think for a long time and figure it out, it gives you a high. And that high is the thing we enjoy. So I tell my students, don't think that it has to be easy so for, for you to be good at something. It has to be hard and then you enjoy that hardness and you enjoy that rush that you get. Difficult. And I think that's universal for men and male and female. I don't see it as a separate issue. Hmm. Julia? To be honest, it's a hard question, I think. <laughs> uh, but it's a good question. Um, I think uh, I would say that if they like the math, if they like the topic, they they should pursue it. That as as was said before, it's it might not be easy, but they they should go for it and probably try not to compare themselves with the other. A lot of the times I have some students in my class that they don't want to ask questions, for example, because they see other students, usually male students, uh, like 
being the ones answering or I ask a question and some students answer without waiting that I like say, yeah, uh, you answer because I try to wait so more people like raise the hand. But it's like, that doesn't mean that the other people knows more or understand more. Uh, it's not like you need to compare yourself. And it's also good to look for people that you feel comfortable to, to ask the questions that you have uh, and create a network. I, I do think that creating networks and finding mentors are really a good way to go and enjoy what you like to do. That's, yeah, do what you enjoy. Mm -hmm. Laura? Yes, I, I feel the same. Go after, go after what you enjoy. I, um... I would say also don't don't be afraid to reach out to your teachers, to your professors, whatever level you're at, whether it's elementary school, middle school, university, graduate school, whatever it is, and really reach out to the to the people that are there that, you know, we're all here to to help. That's that's what we do. We, that's why we're teaching. And um, and uh, you can advocate for yourself and, and just really go after what you're excited about. And I want to have a, you know, encourage curiosity and encourage that interest in the subject. So, yeah. Wonderful. Um, uh, yeah, Shia? I was going to say that uh, really this is a cultural issue as Shabna mentioned, and it's gonna take a long time, educational uh, uh, approach to these issues. But I think things are changing. I, I would also say that families play a very important role. You know, if you encourage your kids, even if they are feeling that they are not doing well, I think the family plays a major role in encouraging them, finding tutors for them and tell them, go talk to your professor, don't give up. Because uh, we have all sort of facilities here that they could benefit from that. We just need to give them that. Uh, human support to them that you can do it and as we say sky is the limit so push yourself nothing is going to fall on your lap you have to work for it it's not that easy is there anything you'd like to add um i'll, I'll give it um typically political science um answer here i think what the film really drove home for me and this is the maybe the message that could be conveyed is um you know, finding freedom in the pursuit of your curiosity, um, whatever that is, uh, can uh, lead you down the paths that may not result in what, you know, Mariam is a honey managed to achieve, but in a sense of, of self-fulfillment that ultimately I think is what mattered to her most as well and what everyone else on this panel has so beautifully conveyed about their particular interests. Wonderful. Well. Thank you, Shayar, Shabnam, Hussein, Laura, Julia, Kevin, and again, all of you for being with us. I'd like to thank the entire IU Cinema team, and particularly Brittany, Seth, David, Max, and Ava, who've all worked behind the scenes to help make this event possible. We'd like to encourage you to go to IU Cinema's virtual screening room to see our upcoming films and events. To all of you who tuned in, thank you once again for being with us. Please be kind, and be generous to yourselves and to others. And we will hope to see you again soon. Thank you all so much and have a great night. <laughs>